So what I'm going to attempt to do tonight is actually very difficult because we are tackling a very, very complex topic, theology, <laughs> and then we're going to add some science to it, which is also one of the most complex topics on the planet right now. So I entitled this, Is There Anything New Under the Sun? Let's see if I can hit the right spot. Okay, I, I hit the right spot, so I can't go to sleep or it'll stop. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is give you a presentation and dig into some of the details of the basic background of global warming or climate change. And you're going to have to keep me on point. I like to walk, and she's trying to keep me on the spot. Hey, so, I like a challenge. And we're going to look at this in light of a biblical worldview. And I would love to spend hours and hours digging into the scriptures. And I don't mean to slight the scriptures in any way or form tonight, but to get through it, I'm going to have to uh, trust you all. I put some references down on the papers I passed out to dig in some of that for yourself. So we're going to talk about a biblical earthkeeping ethic versus the modern environmental movement. And then we're going to get into an overview of climate change and then look at how uh, the models, the climate models, are verifying against observations in our atmosphere. And then we're going to look at some severe weather parameters, tornadoes, hurricanes, and those sorts of things, uh, and see what's happening with those. And wildfires. Colorado cares about wildfires, so I'm going to look at wildfires a little bit as well. I bring this up. This is the nation's premier uh, National Center for Science Education. I'm a meteorologist. I've been studying the atmosphere for well over 20 years now, and uh, climate change has been kind of a passion of mine. And my wife challenged me one day, and she said, is this a secular pursuit? Where is God in this? Where is Jesus? Are you spending all your time researching, reading, and this and that? And then I happened to be reading on the internet one day, and uh, this organization used to have the title there saying, Defending the Teaching of Evolution. And roughly around 2014, they changed their name. They are now the National Center for Science Education, and they put defending the teaching of evolution, and they added climate change. I go, oh, wow, that, that changes things. Well, that was 2014. This is their website today. Uh, it says, we help individuals and communities resist threats to accurate and effective science education. And they vigilantly monitor efforts to, that interfere with the accurate teaching and know what they put first now. Climate change. Accurate teaching of climate change and evolution. I pulled this up because... Oh, my slide. Going back. I had a pop-up. It's probably hidden behind it. Um, this is the leading... Uh, this is my quote. quoting someone else in a book. This is the leading organization in our nation that is opposed to creationism. And they have now put climate change in their own priorities ahead that of evolution. So when I give talks in uh, Christian audiences, I often say, um, if I came to you and talked about the merits of evolution versus creationism, you wouldn't bat an eye. And then I come to you and I say, well, I'm going to talk about climate change. And many people go, well, what does that have to do with it? So I'm trying to draw a connection that climate change is the number one scientific issue for the hearts and minds of our children today. And I'm going to quote a paper they published on their website. This paper was entitled, Defending Science Education, Climate as a Second Front for Biologists. It's time, I'm, I'm skipping around in it, it's time for biologists to help resist the dangers posed by climate change denial. You all tell me if I deny anything tonight. <laughs> Consider that climate change denial affects the way in which biology is learned and taught, studied, and applied. Do you see what they're saying there? Your understanding of climate change affects how you view evolution. And they say, unlike evolution, climate science is not yet comfortably ensconced in the K-12 educational system. There is a lot of work we need to do to make it. Not their words, my own, a paraphrase. We haven't yet brainwashed all the children to believe climate science. We need to do it. That's their words, not mine. 
So for me, climate change has become, uh, as I've dug into a Christian worldview on climate change, um, it has become a theological issue. How you view God and how you view creation and how he made it uh, really lays the framework for how you interpret the data that I'm going to uh, present to you tonight. So why should we care? So here comes a little bit of background. Uh, again, I would love to camp here, but uh, for purposes, we need to move on. And I apologize. Uh, not everyone was able to get a handout who's present because we have a great crowd. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm not, I may skip some things on the, for the sake of time on your handout. So if something's not real obvious, maybe during the question and answer time frame, if you say, uh, do we have a couple extra? A couple extra. So if anyone needs one. Um, you can ask me during Q&A and I'll help you fill in a blank if you miss something. So why should we care? I think it honors God and brings some glory when we keep a biblical worldview that honors God. Okay, so what is a biblical worldview in terms of the environment? Well, if we go uh, throughout Scripture, one, you've quoted other Scriptures tonight that lead to this, but it warns us to be wary of the false teachers that are out there. Um, Jesus says in John that I came to testify to the truth. There is only one truth. Jesus also said, I am the truth. Truth, the life and the way. Truth is not relative. There are facts, and you can ascertain whether these facts are true or not. You don't get to devise your own facts or truth. So uh, the Bible tells us to be very leery and uh, resist those that may lead us away from God. So what is the worldview that the Bible presents of God's creation and the environment? I'm not going to be able to turn there tonight and read these passages, uh, just for the sake of time. But if you dig into Genesis 2, specifically verses 7 and 15, you will see that God had a very specific design and plan for our planet and the universe. That it is robust. It is not fragile. It is intentional. It is not an accident. Here we go. So in there you'll see that God gives us a job. Work is not a bad thing. God created us to work. And specifically for his creation, he told us to work his creation, to make it bring forth fruit. And thank goodness God provided the ability for our planet to bring forth fruit. We'd be pretty hungry if we didn't, right? He also told us to guard it, to keep it. So can we pollute? Absolutely we can pollute. Okay? I grew up on the Potomac River, uh, about 20 miles south of Washington, D.C. And when I was growing up, uh, there was essentially no oxygen in the water. Huge algae blooms from pollution that had gotten into the water. Uh, when I was a young child in the early 80s, you know, many times summer was all green. Uh, they accidentally planted and let it go astray uh, a freshwater seaweed called hydrilla. And it repopulated the water. And now when I turn on ESPN2, to watch bass fishing tournaments, I often see the bass boats running down right in front of where my house is. That ecosystem is healing, and it's one of the best bass fishing places on, uh, in the United States right now. So, uh, yes, we can pollute, but God's, God's uh, creation is resilient. So we need to protect it, but it doesn't mean not to use it. It doesn't mean no, don't go fishing, don't go hunting, don't use the resources that God gave us but do so wisely. And he gives us dominion over the earth as well in Genesis 1, 26-31. In other words, use the earth's resources and the plenty of it to bring him glory. Let's contrast that with the modern environmental movement. What's the number one assumption of the modern environmental movement? Not to, to, the, not to every person, but as a whole, if I had to lump them together. Did I hear it over here? We're the problem, okay? We're going to get there. Uh, how about there is no God? That's their first assumption. Their first assumption is there is no God. And that we are just a cosmic accident put together by just the right thing at the right place at the right time and we're sitting at a tipping point. Therefore, it is very fragile 
and we have to protect it at all costs. Um, also, humans are an enemy of nature. In other words, humans are the problem. Contrast that with what it says in Genesis about humans. Humans, mankind, were the crown jewel of God's creation. We are the only ones made in God's image, and we are the only ones that it says God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then when man exhaled, he polluted the planet. You laugh, but I will show you slides that say that every time we exhale, we are polluting the planet. Okay? I will show you those slides tonight. So it goes against a Christian worldview. That, and also, what did it say about man? When at the beginning and the end of the first day, God saw the creation, he said it was good. And the second day, good. And the third day, good. And when he gets to the sixth day and he creates man, what does he say? He says it was very good. Man is not the enemy of nature. Um, their view is that if man walks across and bends a blade of grass, we have somehow damaged the planet. And that the planet would somehow be better if man was kind of removed from the equation. And you see this in a lot of legislation in the creation of wildlife areas, uh, nature areas where man is not supposed to go into at all. What did God tell Adam and Eve? Go forth, leave the garden, and multiply. Go subdue the earth. Use it for my glory, not don't touch it. Now, you know, can we harm it? Yeah, I, I'm always pained. Uh, I went to Zion National Park this summer, and then recently I saw an article where some, some idiot went in there and started spray painting on the rocks. You know, what a horrible disgrace. Um, so I am an environmentalist. I love the creation, uh, but I love it through the worldview that God gave it to us to take care of, but not uh, to uh, make stuff up to act like it's uh, somehow we're doing damage to it. Which we can, but we'll talk about whether we're doing damage to it or not. So what this leads to, you see this in Romans 1, is the idea of pantheism. Is that people start to worship the creation rather than the creator. Um, we have a term for that in Colorado, right? And elsewhere. Tree hugger, right? Yeah. Okay? You worship... You know, so when I go out and I see the mountains, do I worship the mountains? No. I worship the creator who made those mountains. And in Proverbs 1, 7, it's, 1, 7, it says, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. So how can you claim to have wisdom when your first assumption is there is no God? It just doesn't fit into the biblical worldview. And it says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So bottom line, nature untouched by humans is not a biblical idea. So when you look at environmental policies that exclude humans or cause humans are a problem, and there are plenty of examples I can tell you where humans are a problem, okay? But we're going to look at the context of a global problem with climate change tonight, and we'll, uh, we'll see what the data bears out. All right, so I'd love to camp there for an hour, but that gives you a quick overview. So we're gonna jump into the science. And I'm gonna move quickly, because we have a lot of science to get through. And I apologize, not all of you uh, signed up, I guess, to be in a college class tonight <laughs> and go through some deep science. So if you don't understand something, I apologize. Uh, I will try to answer questions at the end, but this is kind of a, a college level uh, understanding the science, I'll try to explain it. My, my kids are in high school and they've heard this a thousand times, they generally get it. So, uh, sorry it's cutting off there at the top. Let me give you, uh, who's heard of the IPCC? Okay, stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is a government organization. Uh, they are part of the UN, they've been around a while, and every few years they publish a report. They call it an assessment report. 
Um, assessment report number six is supposed to come out next year. There were supposed to be some intermediate reports came out. I checked last night, they did not come out. They're delayed because of COVID. So I will be giving you data from this. And this is another thing. Every piece of data, call me out if I have doctored it, I'm leaning one way or the other. Like I'm giving you the raw data and I'm giving you the location at the bottom of every slide where I pull every piece of information I give. I have nothing to hide. So this is the pro man-made global warming UN organization that puts out a report every few years. And what I'll show you is actually in their report, they actually agree with me in many places, but it doesn't get picked up in the media. All that gets picked up in the media is the very first section, which is called the Summary for Policymakers. So this is a government organization that gets thousands of scientists together. They get scientists from all sides that contribute, but in the Summary for Policymakers, which side of the argument do you think they summarize? Only one side. And that's all you see is at the very beginning uh, from the IPCC. So, um, now you know who the IPCC is. I'll be quoting from them. Everyone hopefully is familiar with the scientific method. We're going to use the scientific method tonight to evaluate a claim of climate change, and you're going to decide for yourself whether or not the data I present support or refute this claim. I apologize. It's cut off there at the top. Is, Rob, is there anything we can do to... I can diddle with it. Just a little bit down. So I pull this quote from Science Magazine in 2010 because Science Magazine is a well-known, reputable publication. Uh, Science Mag, I apologize. We were planning on having slides right here. And I'm a professor, you know, it's always bad to read your slides. I don't have all of this memorized. I know the basic gist, but I don't want to misspeak. So usually you cheat and you look at your teleprompter right here, right? And I don't have my teleprompter. But in general, what the Science Magazine said in 2010 is that natural causes have always played a role in our climate that's changing. But recent man-made changes that are unprecedented are uh, overcoming, are uh, dwarfing the natural causes. And because of this, the warming planet will cause other climatic patterns, the hydrologic cycle, to cause more floods, more droughts, more this, more that, more of everything, the sky is falling. Science Magazine, direct quote, 2010. Couple quick definitions. So I'm a meteorologist. Meteorologists study weather. What is climate? Climate is just the sum of weather with time. What happens today is weather, and we add that with what happens tomorrow, or this day next year, or this day of the year after, and we sum it together, we average it, we get an idea of what are the bounds of our climate. What is realistic? Uh, I will use the term global warming. Uh, when you hear that in the news, they generally mean anthropogenic. One of the kids in the back. What does anthropogenic mean? Anyone know? You can yell it out. Any ideas? Gotta be loud. Caused by humans. Yeah, human cause, man-made. So I will try to distinguish between when I'm saying this warming was caused by natural causes versus man-made. So the abbreviation for anthropogenic or man-made you'll see often referred to as AGW. So uh, I'll show you why in a minute they changed the term from climate or global warming to climate change because we quit warming for 15 or 20 years, uh, not so long ago. So they changed the name to climate change and then they have to up the ante so now it's climate crisis or climate catastrophe. Essentially in what you read it all means the same thing to them. So, this is uh, the greenhouse effect. But I do have a laser. Sorry for those who are online, you can probably not see the laser. Have we ever got going online? No? Yes? Yeah, Zoom's working. Zoom is working. Welcome out there in Zoom world. So, in short, as our, uh, our skit tonight kind of alluded to, uh, we have shortwave radiation, primarily in the form of visible light that comes from the sun. It mostly passes through the atmosphere. Some of it's reflected off by things like clouds and so forth, but a good chunk of it gets to the Earth's surface and warms it. The Earth's surface warms, and then it re-radiates out long wave radiation in infrared, infrared radiation. 
If there was no atmosphere, if there were no greenhouse gases, this radiation would just go back off into space. And we looked it up tonight. We would roughly be about minus 15 Celsius uh, on average around the planet. That's roughly about the temperature we're going to be tonight. Would you have any plant growth? Would you have be able to grow food on our planet? In other words, the planet would be too cold for life. Okay, so we could compute this because we know how much energy is coming from the sun. And uh, so good thing our atmosphere has certain gases called greenhouse gases that absorb uh, parts of this radiation and then re-radiate it in all directions and some of it is back down to earth. And that's why we stay warm enough for life on our planet. So what are those greenhouse gases? They took away my uh, thunder. But what is the most abundant greenhouse gas in our atmosphere? Water vapor. Okay, this is straight out of the textbook I use in my class. I'm sorry, maybe my eyes are going bad. That's a little blurry. So on the left-hand side, we have all of our permanent gases. These are not greenhouse gases. 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, doesn't absorb infrared. 21%, thank goodness, is oxygen, doesn't absorb infrared. But we have water vapor, which is around 0 to 4 percent, let's just say 2 percent of the atmosphere on average. Uh, in the tropics, it can get up to about 9 percent, almost 10 percent. So if you get up to 10 percent, that means one out of every 10 molecules in the atmosphere are water vapor in the tropics. One out of 10. The second most abundant, which is all you ever hear about in the news, is carbon dioxide. And does anyone know the level at which we measure carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? Parts per million. Parts per million. And it's currently about, this uh, textbook's a few years old, it says 385. The last I checked, we have a CO2 meter at home, it's about 410 parts per million. Uh, Pre-industrial revolution, it was about 300 parts per million. So mankind, it looks like, from the burning of fossil fuels, is increasing but we've increased to roughly 400 parts per million. And remember, 2 to 4% on average is how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. What's another word for water vapor you use probably a whole lot more? Not in Colorado much, thank goodness. Humidity, humidity okay? I, uh, my previous job, I was down in Florida, and we know all about humidity, okay? So we know it's, it's variable. It's not the same everywhere. Um, tonight, we're going to get down probably to around zero. If we get a cloud to move in, are we going to get as cold? No, why not? Because around that cloud, in order for that cloud to be present, there has to be water vapor. Without water vapor, no cloud. So that infrared that's trying to escape the atmosphere is going to run into the cloud, get absorbed, and go back down, and you won't get as cold. We see the greenhouse effect in weather every single day caused by water vapor. Um, of note, CO2 is very well mixed and it's pretty much about the same level everywhere on the planet. Okay, so if you go measure it in Antarctica, you're going to roughly get the same number as you measure it here, around 400 parts per million. It does vary with season. Um, why might it vary with season? Tree growth. Leaves. Tree growth and leaves, great point. Um, I have a son who's in high school taking SATs and that. So you, what do you call it? Similes, right? Or you, you, so you say, O2 is to humans as CO2 is to plants. Plants consume CO2 just like we consume oxygen. CO2 is our waste product and it is food for plants. And what's plants' waste product? Thank goodness. Oxygen. Man, what a quinky dink. It's almost like someone designed that. Okay, so yes, CO2 does vary interannually. Uh, the northern hemisphere summer, a lot of trees and growth and plants, it eats up a bunch of CO2, and CO2 levels drop a little bit, and then they go back up in the wintertime a little bit. We're talking a few parts per million, and they are ticking up with time. All right, so let's keep going. So, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the sun, the earth emits electromagnetic waves. The sun primarily invisible light, so we have our... Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, okay? And the sun also emits some ultraviolet rays. Um, the earth is much cooler, so the earth primarily, I've already said this, emits in the infrared waves. So first real tough graph of the night here. This is what's called a Planck curve, which shows the energy emitted by an object. 
So the curve on the left is the sun's curve. And it shows that the maximum intensity of the sun is in visible light. See how that works? The sun also emits less UV good. So the way you read this graph is the first part is the total absorption and scattering of the atmosphere. So visible light primarily is not absorbed by the atmosphere. You know this through your experience. It passes through. We see sunlight come to us hopefully just about every day. A lot of what, 320 days of sun here in Colorado, it's good. How this works though, we know that UV is mostly absorbed by the atmosphere. By what gas? We hear about it all the time too. Ozone. Ozone. So you see where ozone absorbs and where it contributes to the total. So UV is absorbed by ozone. See how that works? So that's the sun. The second curve is the Earth's curve. And this is what you would measure if you uh, were looking at what the Earth is emitting up, the greenhouse effect. And so you see that the uh, infrared is absorbed by a combination of gases, the greenhouse gases. Which gas absorbs and accounts for most of this curve? Water vapor. And then you have CO2 and methane. You hear a lot about methane, and per molecule methane is very powerful, but you know what we measure methane in? Parts per billion, and it doesn't absorb very much in the spectrum. And look at methane. So methane already uh, is in the same part of the spectrum where water vapor already absorbs. In other words, if a photon of energy is trying to leave our atmosphere, and it's already 100% of the time absorbed by water vapor at that particular wavelength, does it matter? Is there a net change if a different molecule absorbs it? It's not leaving to begin with. The way I explain this to my mom, hi mom, if you're out there, she was trying to get on YouTube earlier. She doesn't understand science. Think about anyone ever shoot a rifle, okay? Um, oh, I forgot to say this. My name is Dr. Paul Holman. You don't hear any military or government title with that. I'm here as a private citizen tonight, not representing the government or DOD. Have to get that out of the way. But, um, so I am in the military, I've shot a rifle a few times. So if you have 20 feet of concrete, and you're gonna, are you gonna stop a bullet? Does it matter if you add a piece of paper on the front end or the back end? Does it change the net effect? No. It doesn't matter if I add a ream of paper, or 100 reams of paper, is there a net change? No. So when you hear all this stuff in the news about methane, yes, methane might absorb more. But in most of the spectrum where methane absorbs, methane doesn't absorb everywhere, it only absorbs in a couple places. Water vapor is already absorbing there. So CO2, which we'll talk a lot about. Mom says hi, by the way. Oh, mom's on there. <laughs> hi, mom. <laughs> She's come to these before, but she wants to see if I'm on my game tonight. All right, so water vapor, we've already established, is the most abundant. You're more likely to run into it. And it, by far, is the, the most radiatively active greenhouse gas. And going forward, Emily, can you hit the down button? Here you go, one more. So if you look, there are two bands where CO2 absorbs, and I highlighted where they contribute in the uh, total. One is out here, and it's out on the edge of where Earth emits. So there's not much energy to absorb there in the first place, so that doesn't contribute that much. And there's this other one right here, I want to say it's at 9 microns, 9 to 11 microns. Uh, and water vapor absorbs there, but only about 50-60% of the time. So it does contribute, CO2 is an important greenhouse gas. But if you look at the total area there, which gas would you say contributes the most to the greenhouse effect? Water vapor or CO2? Water vapor. By clear, water vapor here. All right, oh, so council majority, by far the most important. When I read, or you can do this control F thing, right? In the IPCC report, in their executive summary, uh, the last one mentioned CO2 119 times, and it mentioned water vapor zero. Zero. You mean the most abundant and the most radio? It, it just doesn't even mention it. Uh, I go to conferences and I go grab the new climate textbooks. You grab an old climate textbook, say pre-1970, and you go to the glossary and you'll see CO2 mentioned. 
you know, four or five times, you'll see water vapor mentioned a couple dozen times. Now, you go through the same textbook, how many times do you think CO2 is mentioned? Hundreds of times, and water vapor is mentioned once or twice. See a problem with this? Here is uh, a curve showing the absorption across the infrared for CO2. The green line is as if we had no CO2. So there's those CO2 absorption bands. And if we had no CO2, you'd have um, uh, more energy escaping the atmosphere. So the black line is where we're at today, about 400 parts per million. And the red line is if we doubled CO2. So what you're looking at is essentially the difference between the black line and the red line. And if you have trouble seeing it, that's correct. You can almost see almost zero change. There's a little bit, but it's hard to see by doubling CO2. Methane's in the news. You will find the, um, um, actually, I, I'm sorry I misspoke. It's still parts per million. It's just not in the hundreds. It's in the single digits. Okay, so uh, we have about 1.8 parts per million of methane. And you can see the difference between the black and the red for methane. So even if we doubled the amount of methane, the net effect to radiation trying to leave our planet is pretty much zilch. Okay? This uh, graph was done by Dr. Will Happer. He's a PhD at Princeton. He served under a Democratic and a Republican, both the Bush and Clinton years, in their, uh, as a director of energy. Okay? So really well. Happened to have a guy I work with who was a roommate with him in college. Uh, so small, I don't know, I've never met him, only seen him. So here's a graph from uh, ABC News. And it says, so when I do a Google search, for you kids in the back, when they tell you to do your homework, when you punch things into Google, Google will often give you the wrong answer. I've clearly established that water vapor is a greenhouse gas and it's the most abundant. It's in the meteorology textbooks. There is no argument about that. That is not up for debate. That is the truth, but you can try to hide truth. This is ABC News, this, and this is their caption, not mine, theirs. This graph shows the distribution of greenhouse, girths, uh, greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is clearly the majority. Only if you leave out water vapor. Okay, that's ABC News. Fake news. Here's Weather Underground. I use Weather Underground. Some of you probably use Weather Underground. This is their graphic explaining the greenhouse effect. Kind of cool, pretty simple. CO2 and other gases. So they do mention water vapor, kind of. Other. You mean like the most abundant? <laughs> um, this is, uh, sorry, it's, it's cut off down here. I really apologize. It says, this is from the National Park Service. Why the National Park Service needs to explain to you the greenhouse effect, well, you can try to understand uh, maybe why. Um, so this is the normal greenhouse effect, and normal CO2, and greenhouse effect, rampant CO2. Again, they're trying to explain the normal greenhouse effect and a rampant greenhouse effect and no mention of water. Your tax dollars at work. Found this one. Told you. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. oh, right there. I found this early this morning, about 4:30 a.m. <laughs> King County, Washington. Okay, uh, King County, Washington. It's the county that Seattle is in. They decided they need to inform their public about greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect. They don't even bother to use anything. They just call it pollution. Sun, incoming energy, trapped energy. You know, there's your house polluting, there's your car polluting, there's the factory polluting, there's the cow breathing or farting, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Read between the lines here. They're saying CO2 is a pollutant. There is, uh, we have never been able to pass cap and trade, a CO2 monitoring uh, legislation through Congress here in the United States. It's impossible, you can't get anything done in Congress, you all know that. So how do we get things done now? Executive order. Under President Obama, he passed an executive order ordering the EPA, and the EPA declared CO2 as part of the Clean Water and Air and Energy Act uh, a pollutant that can be regulated. Okay? It's called the endangerment finding. 
People have been trying to find a way to get that to the Supreme Court ever since and has yet to make it to the Supreme Court, but through executive order, the EPA can regulate CO2 as a pollutant. So if you're a King County commissioner, you're just doing what the EPA is telling you, it's a pollutant. Speaking of the EPA, can you really blame ABC News? You think they're gonna be our scientists for us? This is a graph of, uh, this is not a current graph. This graph I took off the internet roughly around 2014. And this is their page of overview of greenhouse gases. And I apologize, the font is small, but it looks a lot like that ABC News thing. Any mention of water vapor? No. Which one's the majority? Carbon dioxide. Uh, I went there again last night. They have updated this page. Uh, magically was updated in the middle of the last administration. Uh, it is more factually accurate now. If you go to this webpage on the EPA, it at least says overview of greenhouse gas emissions. So what is emitted? Now I would argue we emit water vapor all the time. What else do you breathe out when you breathe out? Other than CO2. Water vapor. That's why my mouth is dry right now. <laughs> we know this in Colorado. How many of you water your grass in the summertime? Wouldn't that be a greenhouse gas emission when it evaporates? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What's the byproduct of combustion? CO2 and water vapor. Okay. That's why you see contrails coming out of airplanes. That's why you see a vapor cloud on a cold day like this coming out of the back of your car. But they don't count it as a greenhouse gas, so you don't have to have it on the slide. Can I get my point here? So I go to uh, NOAA, thank goodness those that are in charge of weather actually have water vapor. And they say water vapor is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere, which is why it's addressed here first. And they even say, but as of yet, it's fairly poorly measured and understood. And I agree with that. And there's a little caveat on here, and I'm not going to go into it, is the debate on whether or not water vapor is a forcing in a climate or a feedback. And I'm going to define those terms for you going forward. So uh, water vapor is a greenhouse gas and we need to pay. So I teach class, uh, atmospheric thermodynamics class. And the entire class, there's one class where we call it dry thermodynamics. And we drive a whole bunch of equations and we keep water vapor out of it because it makes the equations very, very complicated and hard to deal with. So we learn it in a dry atmosphere and we go, okay, but this isn't real. There's no such thing as a dry atmosphere. So then we add water vapor and it makes it a mess. And that's one of the reasons why weather forecasts go so wrong because it is so hard to quantify humidity and get it right in our atmosphere. Because humidity is the basis for every storm, right? You can't get clouds, you can't get rain, you can't get tornadoes, you can't get hurricanes without water vapor. And quantifying water vapor in our weather models is one of the most difficult things. That's why the weather guys are only right half the time, right? <laughs> so, uh, let's quickly talk uh, a little more science here. So the IPCC, the EPA, and others say water vapor can be ignored because it's not forcing the climate. So this is a uh, paper done back in 2006 by Dr. Christie and Norris at the University of Alabama, Huntsville. And let me try to explain this very rapidly. So in California, they had sensors in the Central Valley, down low in the valley. They had sensors in the adjacent foothills, and they had sensors up in the high Sierras. And they have them, oh, sorry, this goes back to like 1930, I think, through 2000. And they said, let's look at the temperatures with time at each of these locations. And so when you hear temperature of the planet, oh my, battery just died. Where's the other mic? And do I just hold the bottom button to turn it on? All right, we're back. Okay. So when you hear the temperature is increasing, what they're generally talking about is the average temperature. But we have the ability to just deconstruct today's average temperature. It's usually today's maximum plus today's minimum divided by two, we have an average. Pretty simple math. Anyone lost? It's not that hard. So instead of just, so if you look at the uh, minimum in California, they're in pretty much lockstep uh, it's colder up in the Sierras until about 1970 and suddenly you see how the red line is separating from the blue line. So when does the minimum typically occur? Daytime or nighttime? Nighttime, nighttime or early morning, okay? 
But look at the same time frame, the difference between the valleys and the foothills, do you see a separation for the maximum? In other words, it is getting warmer at night, but not warmer during the day. Anyone figure that one out? What would cause that? Watering your grass. <laughs> what do they do in California in the Central Valley? They farm. And what did they start doing in the 60s and 70s? They started building all these aqueducts and reservoirs, and they really ramped up their food production. And when do they water primarily? Nighttime. Nighttime. And then it heats up during the day, the water evaporates, the wind blows, and mixes out. So if I were just to show you, though, the average temperature, you would be told that it's getting hotter. But it's not getting hotter at this case. This is a very specific locality. It's not getting hotter during the day. It's getting warmer at night. It's not as cold at night. Is that hard to survive or is that easy to survive? Okay? So they suggest and I suggest that this is water vapor, a anthropogenic warming because man is irrigating his crops at night. Okay? So I decided to test this. Um, by the way, does CO2 fluctuate from day to night, or is it always there? It's always there. So if the warming in this case was due to CO2, we should see a uh, first order effect. It's more complicated than that, dynamic nonlinear system. But you would expect to see both warming during the day and the night because that infrared energy is being absorbed by CO2 both day and night. Okay? And the water vapor, again, blows away and mixes out, and they mostly turn off their sprinklers during the day. So I think I made my points. Water vapor is forcing this warming. See, it's not a feedback. It is a forcing. Um, real quick, I was uh, at Avalon Air Force Base. Um, we have data back to the 1930s as well. If you look at the mean, all you need to really see is the slope. So if I only showed you the slope of the mean or the average, you would say it's getting warmer at Anglin Air Force Base. But when you go and you look at the max, oh, wait, it's flat. And you look at the nighttime lows, they're getting warmer there as well. And I think we have the same similar evidence. There's the population chart. And just fill in the blank of how many more golf courses, how many more lawns, uh, there could be a natural circulation change that's putting more water vapor in, but the only real way, the first thing that I would have to rule out is why is it getting warmer at night, not during the day? Water vapor explains that pretty easily. CO2 does not. Okay? Now, I've not explained or talked to you about anything on a global scale, just certain locales. You see this in Palm Springs. It used to be a desert. Now they put a lot of golf courses in. Okay? Um, you see this. Anyone ever heard of the urban heat island effect? Okay? Um, I, pull, I have a graph, I don't think I have it with me tonight, but I've done it. Uh, they built the IA about, what, 25 years ago? And it's been warming ever since. Has the city been growing closer to it or further away from it? Okay, how much concrete has been laid in and around the IA where we measure in the last 20, 25 years? That is man-made warming. That is anthropogenic warming. But it's not CO2, it's concrete, okay? So let's talk about temperature data sets. This is roughly the last 2,000 years, published in Physical Geography in 2010. Um, and this is looking at the changes in temperature using what we call proxy data. Uh, these are things like ice cores, uh, pollen spore samples, things that we can use as a proxy to help determine what the general idea for temperature is. What caused all these ups and downs? What could have caused them? Change in water vapor in the sun. Okay, the sun. Changes in cycles in the sun. What else? Volcanoes. Volcanoes. Ocean currents. Ocean currents. Lots of things. The short answer is we don't know. I'm not up here tonight claiming I know everything. I'm trying to actually tell you. The more I study this, the more I know I don't know. We have some theories on what caused some of these. Um, the little ice age here. Uh, it was really warm, so Roman warm period, medieval warm period, by the way, this is when most of your castles and um, cathedrals were built in Europe because it was really warm and they were able to be outside more and do more. So during this time frame, um, they grew grapes in London. It is too cold to grow grapes in London today. 
There are streets in London named after the types of grapes that they grew a thousand years ago there. And then it got much colder. We call this the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age, the Thames River in London, frequently froze over. The Thames River, although they're trying to tonight, we were talking about this. Um, the fountains in Trafalgar Square froze this week for the first time in a long time. Wow. Um, the Thames River regularly during this time frame froze over and they had wonderful ice fairs in London. Too warm today, the Thames River does not fly, uh, freeze over. My point is there have been natural forcings that have caused climate to go up and down and up and down. Um, we suspect, because we invented uh, telescopes about right here, and we were watching the sun, that the sun went into a very inactive period called the Maunder Minimum, and it was the sun that, uh, less output from the sun that helped us cool. And then we started to warm. No, when did we start to warm? What year? About 1700. Okay. Um, one of the theories of why the Vikings couldn't survive, they went to Greenland. Go to Greenland's official tourist webpage. It really used to be green when they arrived. It was warm. It was green. It had a lot of plant life. And then the Vikings uh, slowly died off in Greenland, and they got as far south as Newfoundland. And one of the theories why they didn't survive is it got too dang cold. Okay? Um, they're not just heroic stories from uh, the Revolutionary War of uh, Valley Forge and, and all those sorts of things. It was actually a much colder time right about that time than we are today. I don't know how they did it. They were tougher than we were. Okay? But when did the warming start? 1700. Thomas Jefferson writes about it in his memoirs that uh, the snow and the frost doesn't come as far down the mountain as it used to. Uh, it started warming. When did we invent the internal combustion engine? It's about 1880. So it started warming for over 150 years before we ever started emitting more CO2 to the atmosphere. So this is a proxy record, and then I'm throwing on the thermometer record, and yes, we have continued to warm. The question, and I'm not saying I have the answer, the question is, is this a continuation of the natural forcings that we just don't actually understand completely, or is this man-made warming, uh, or a combination of the two? The answer is it's probably a combination of the two, but is it a lot of CO2 or a little bit of CO2 affecting this? I don't know, I showed you some of the math and the science. I'll let you make your own conclusions. So this was a graph done by a rep uh, reputable guy in a uh, physical geography and published. Um, some of you may recognize this. This was originally published in now Dr. Michael Mann's uh, master's thesis at Penn State, mm -hmm. and then Al Gore picked it up and put it into, IPCC picked it up and put it into one of their reports, and Al Gore picked it up, and this is the famous graph used in his movie, The Inconvenient Truth. This covers the same period of time, roughly. Um, it's only the last thousand years, the previous one. Wait a minute. Where's that little ice age? Do you see it? It's gone. And then you have all the rapid warming in the thermometer record. So this is what's um, known as the hockey stick. See the blade for the hockey stick? Okay. So which one is right? We have competing data. Well, if you notice, this one was published after this one. The only difference in the data set between these two graphs is tree ring data sets. We can use tree rings as a proxy for many things. But what they went back, what this guy did, is he went back and he said, well, we have thermometers over the last 100 years or so. So let's look at the tree rings over the last 100 years or so and see if the tree rings tell us this should be warming or cooling. Well, the tree rings actually tell us it should be cooling. So if you put something in that uh, dampens the signal, <laughs> you dampen out cold periods, and you dampen out warm periods, and you make it look flatter. So the only difference between these two graphs is a tree ring data set. And so uh, I would argue that it's been proven that the tree ring data sets should not have been included, and when you do include them, you see these major natural fluctuations. When you include bad data, you get to use the narrative that the climate has been fairly stable, the natural forcings aren't that big, and then all of a sudden the man-made forcings are huge. See how you can do that? All right. Uh, for time frame, I'm going to... Well, real quick. 
Same data, different message. Be careful, careful, careful when you read scientific graphs. Scientists like me like to manipulate you what you see or what you think. So what I have graphed here is the surface temperature data set uh, in blue and the carbon dioxide increasing in uh, orange. So if I just play with the scale on the graph, these are the identical data points, just I'm playing with the scale. So if I want to go look, oops, it went back. If I want to go look, a relatively small amount of CO2 can make a huge change in temperature. I could make that argument. Or I could say a relatively uh, large change in CO2 ch causes a small change in temperature. But it's the same data. So um, uh, correlation does not always equal causation. So the best way to do it is try to correlate it, put them on top of each other, and you can see, and this is what they do, um, and you put, uh, I made this graph uh, from the original data, and you have increases in CO2. Uh, this is CO2 emissions with temperature over time, and you can go, wow, it looks like CO2 is driving temperature there. Well, let's examine it just a little bit closer. So from 1880 to 1944, we saw 40% of our warming, but did we see much, only 13% of CO2 was emitted. From 1944, sitting right up here, what happened roughly 19, mid-1940s? The end of World War II, right? And then what do we call that period? Some of you are from that generation, right? We call it the, the baby boomers, the post-war economic boom. The economies took off and we actually started producing a lot more, and you can see it, CO2, there's kind of an inflection point. We ramped up CO2 production. But what did the temperatures do for the next two decades? It went down, not up. Um, but you kind of get the point. So we get temperature dropping while we have 21% of the emissions. And then right here in our lifetimes, uh, for about 15 years, temperature didn't increase at all. We call this the pause while 31% of CO2 emissions were produced. All right, so that was a surface-based temperature data set. I really like to use satellite-based temperature data sets because surface-based temperature data sets are biased to land. Are there more thermometers over the land or over the oceans? Over the land. Is our planet more ocean or more land? So if you really want to look at the entire planet, you're trying to get an even sampling over the whole thing, and the way we do that is satellites. We've had satellites doing this since 1979, and we do see a warming trend. Am I denying it? Am I a climate denier? No, I'm showing you on the data that I say I recommend a warming trend. But we can see certain things in the, in the trend. Uh, 1991, anyone remember what happened in 1991 globally that maybe impact temperatures made a drop? War? No, yeah, we did have a war. Natural though. Volcano. Which one? Pinatubo. Mount Pinatubo erupted and pumped all kinds of uh, particulates up into their upper stratosphere, blocked sunlight, and we saw a two or three year cooling period. So we can see natural events. Anyone ever heard of El Nino? Anyone remember the really big one in 97, 98? I do, I was going to college in California for a semester, there it is. Uh, we had another El Nino, and this is current. As of uh, a few days ago, we wrapped up the January data set. Um, do you hear in the news that last month, or two months ago, December 2020, was the sixth largest drop in temperature in the last 40 years? Globally, not here, but globally, that's a big drop right here. So there's December, and then we dropped a little bit more. Uh, we'll have to see how February looks, but it feels pretty cold outside. But we're not talking what it feels like here, we're looking at the entire globe. Um, there's the pause again, uh, where a lot of this global warming hoopla was going on and being propagated in the news, but we didn't warm at all for about 15 years, and that's why they had to change the name from global warming to climate change because the data was showing no warming while CO2 was going up. Um, there's the pause. All right, real quick, way feedback works. So if I increase CO2, it's going to get warmer. I agree with that. You have to, there is a warming caused by CO2. If it gets warmer, what's going to happen to water in the oceans? We're going to evaporate more. And this is why they say that water vapor is a uh, feedback, not a forcing, because in this case it is. CO2 forces warming, 
you get more water vapor uh, because of the temperature increase. That increases the greenhouse effect, which causes more temperature increase, which causes more water vapor, and you get sucked into this perpetual cycle of warming, 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 warming. This is what's called a positive feedback. But are there negative feedbacks? Short answer is yes. If I evaporate water, what am I going to make more of? Clouds. Clouds. It turns out clouds, some trap in heat. I already gave you an example of that. And others will block the sunlight from coming in. So it depends upon how much and what type of clouds. Um, has anyone felt it get a whole lot hotter when it rains or snows? Or does it get a little colder? Colder. Precipitation. If you increase water vapor, you're going to get more precipitation. Precipitation cools the planet. In other words, it's got to stay in some sort of semblance of balance. And I'm not all that afraid of a runaway greenhouse effect because if you get too far in one direction, one of these negative feedbacks will kick in and help you get back in the other ways. There's all kinds of geological rocks and this and that that feed into this, um, so on and so forth. So positive and negative feedbacks. I think uh, uh, aerosols, whether they're man-made, man-made pollution cools the planet. Actual real pollution. It blocks sunlight. Isn't that funny? You know, the stuff that we want to get rid of would cool the planet. So um, there's a study that just came out last week about it. Um, I didn't have time to pull it, though. So bottom line is really, really hard to model these. There's hundreds, if not thousands of these. And there's very few that we understand very well. This is from uh, Dr. Dick Lindzen at MIT. And he tried to model. These are the climate models that the UN was using as part of the IPCC. Um, this was looking at one of the radiated forcings in the upper atmosphere as measured by a satellite. And, um, well, no, not measured. These are all the model's predictions. And what you can see here, you don't have to be a scientist, all of those slopes are all the same, right? Not exactly the same, but they all have a negative slope. In this case, the way the graph is, a negative slope means a positive feedback, which led the IPCC to conclude, since all of our models have a positive feedback, our models must be robust and correct. So Dr. Lindzen at MIT uh, decided to try to measure this with a satellite, figured it out, and what he found. No model had this single feedback right. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of feedbacks. This is complicated. Um, so this is a graph that shows uh, all the really squiggly lines, there's 102 of them, are all the models that the UN used in the last IPCC report. The red line is the average showing dramatic warming forecasted in the models. This was put together by Dr. John Christie and he put this graph in front of Congress in congressional testimony. Um, all of these other plots, the circles, the squares, and the diamonds, are independent, different universities, different government organizations, uh, weather balloons, satellites, uh, independent measurements of the atmosphere. Again, I'm not denying, don't you see a warming trend? But is the warming trend as dramatic as the models predict? No, they're diverging. But they tell us their playbook. Right out of the IPCC report, they say climate projections and associated risk assessments for future warmer worlds are based on data, climate models. Um, and they admit that they do not include all the existing system feedbacks that we've been talking about. So they ignore the data and say, but our models must be right. A uh, complicated graph, but this is pulled right from one of the reports. This was done by Dr. John Christie, who was that California study I showed you earlier. He was on the IPCC committee, and he insisted that this figure be put in because of its importance. Um, and this is hard to read, so he makes it a little simpler to understand. So what we're looking at is uh, the warming in degrees Celsius by decade with height in the atmosphere. And those 102 models that we were looking at uh, are the red bounds. And what you will notice is that the greatest warming is not actually down at the ground in the models. The greatest warming is in the upper atmosphere. So when you hear of all these temperature data sets about how it's getting warmer, 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 well, again, CO2 shouldn't cause most of its warming on the ground. It should cause most of its warming in the upper atmosphere. So they pump these models full of CO2 scenarios, and they make warming. He takes out, so the, what I showed you with those uh, data sets of the actual data, 
the weather balloons, the satellites, that's the gray line. Notice there's zero overlap between the range of the model predictions with height and the natural, excuse me, the, uh, the data that we are recording. And if he removes the, all the CO2 inputs, you get the blue. In other words, reality, the data, would work better with models that don't even consider CO2 than the ones they are making that do consider CO2. We have a, my background, my PhD work was in computer modeling. Uh, I skipped some of those slides and equations because you'd go to sleep. But uh, uh, we have problems with our models, is the bottom line. Okay, and uh, I found this graph the other day, it's kind of cool. This is just for Canada. There's all those hundreds of models again. There's the average, and then there's what they're observing in Canada right now. So all these models are over forecasting, except for two or three, what is going on in Canada. Um, last year I was giving this talk and I was a little worried because I started seeing all these headlines in the news that said 50-year-old climate models are correctly predicting and climate models are getting it right. And these are all the headlines I'm seeing in the news. So I said, well, let me go read the paper. So I did. And uh, sorry again, it's cut off on the screen here. Uh, here are, here, you can go read the paper. It was published last year. I took their data table and I made charts. So the headlines in the paper and in the news is that the climate models are doing well. So there's um, plus or minus 10 degrees off, plus or minus 20 degree, uh, 10 to 20 degrees too hot, 20 to 50 degrees too hot, and over 50 degrees too hot. And there are some that are too cold, but not many. So not many. So in the paper that they say the models are doing well, I don't mean in so your intelligence, but can you interpret it whether they're doing well or not? And that, I mean, I don't know if these people read the paper. I don't know if people who wrote the paper read their own data. That is the data from the paper. All right, so we talked about data, we talked about models, we talked about climatology. Remember the last thing in that hypothesis that severe weather events are getting worse? So we're going to roll through these really fast. But this is Global Hurricanes put together by Dr. Ryan Mao, and I give you a link where you can go look this up. Um, the top is all hurricanes, and the bottom is major hurricanes, category uh, three or higher. Do you see a discernible upward trend in global hurricanes over the last 20 years? How many times have you heard we're getting more hurricanes? All the time. Every single day. So maybe we're not getting more, maybe they're getting stronger. So we're getting bigger and stronger hurricanes. So, um, oh, by the way, I'm quoting their Bible. This is IPCC report. If you dig in a thousand pages, they themselves say there is low confidence regarding the change in tropical cyclone number. It's in the report. It just doesn't make the headline. So maybe we're not having more hurricanes, but the ones we're having are stronger and bigger. So Dr. Mao, this is what he did for his PhD dissertation. He developed this tool called the accumulated cyclone energy. You can think of it as kinetic energy. How much energy is in a storm? If a storm is bigger, it's going to have more energy. If a storm lasts longer, it's going to have more energy. And you can see some wild fluctuations, but again, do you see any like just discernible upward, upward trend? And this is global. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Northern, no. Yeah, the top is global, the bottom is northern hemisphere. So we are not having more hurricanes, and they are not necessarily getting stronger. In fact, when you look at the United States, uh, what this graph shows is the average number of days between a major hurricane hitting the United States. Between 2005 and 2017, we had no major hurricanes hit the United States. That is 4,320 days, and that is twice what we had seen in the past. Double the record actually the other way of the lack of strong hurricanes hitting the United States. But as soon as you have one or two hit the United States, the sky is falling, right? So we are actually well below average. Um, and since this is a graph of the number of days, if you happen to look at the red line, and this red line isn't adjusted for that, because I had to add that on, because I can't. Um, this is Roger Pelkey, right? I think Roger, he's at Colorado State. Um, he made this graph. So uh, yeah, Roy Spencer made this graph. The number of US major landfalling by decade we are actually having less and less major hurricanes hitting the United States. Don't have time, but I can explain why a warming planet would cause less hurricanes. 
So this is from the IPCC report. There's low confidence that the number of very intense cyclones is increasing globally. It's in the UN report. You just got to dig a thousand pages. Okay, but we're getting more tornadoes, right? And I finally got it. See the graph? More tornadoes. See this nice little jump right here around 1988? Anyone know what the name of the National Weather Service radar is? I taught a radar course today, actually. This was the lesson. It's called the WSR 88D. 88 stands for 1988, and the D stands for Doppler. So starting 1988, we developed radars that could detect tornadoes. So what do you think after we could detect them? More tornadoes. So there were tornadoes that were previously going undetected, hence why the data is going up. Uh, 50, 60 years ago, how big was Oklahoma City? Okay, so if there was a tornado five miles outside of town, there was no radar, nobody saw it, we didn't count. Now how big is Oklahoma City? It's kind of hard to get a, uh, and there's all these weather chasers going after them, so we don't miss too many tornadoes. So, not me, but the National Weather Service says when I detrend the tornado data and adjust for population growth, do you see an increase in tornadoes? Again, you, uh, yeah, um, Increase in tornado reports over the last 54 years is almost entirely due to secular trends, population increase. And we go, uh, this is a graph I pulled from NOAA as well. Here is the, so maybe we're not having more tornadoes, maybe we're having stronger tornadoes. The strong tornadoes are decreasing, and uh, I believe that was 2018, the lowest number of tornadoes in recorded history. But I'm sure the headlines all said big, bad tornadoes, right? I think that might have been the first year in recorded history we had zero tornado deaths. I could be incorrect. Uh, I think I read that. Don't quote me. Wildfires. Oops. Hey, Emily. Ah, oh, she can't do it. Oh, there you go. This is, uh, you can't see it. This is from thehill.com. This was published just a few days ago. Wildfires, we care about that a lot here in Colorado, okay? It says, 2020 sets new record for U.S. acreage burned in wildfires. And it was also one of the hottest on record. Hill.com. Um, go ahead and build, oh, uh, I can do it. They quote the correct amount, 10.3 million acres. Sounds like a lot, right? And uh, when you dig in, they got a reputable source. And I went to that source. Well, they only went back to 1960. So it's only a record if you go back to 1960. You guys want to see what happened before 1960? Oh. My slides aren't going the way I wanted them to. Oh. Sorry, I updated this, but it didn't save. So um, 2015, so we put 2020 in instead of 10.13. At the top, you'll see 10.3. And it says uh, since 1960. The blue line, so there's 1960, and we see this moderate increase. Look at how much burned before 1960. Wow. If it was truly a record, we would have had to have five times the amount of wildfires we had. Five times. Because, and this is from the same data set. Um, that's from the National Interagency Fire Center, and they're quoting the National Interagency Fire Center. I go to the same place. They just stopped looking at data before 1960 because it doesn't fit their narrative. So many, many years in the 20s, 30s, and 40s where we had way more wildfires. Um, I haven't had time to look at, one could argue, well, we're getting more in California and more in Colorado and less in other places. That's very interesting and that needs to be looked at. But this is on a national average. Oh yeah, and uh, prior to 1960, it didn't include Arizona or Alaska. Any wildfires happened there? <laughs> um, and what the orange line is, is the number of wildfires. So not only did we see the acreage go down, we saw the number of wildfires go down. And if you ask me the question of why there was such a significant drop there, I actually don't know. Just for North America only? This is for the United 50 United States. You know, one of the things that, that your graph reflects is you think about when the Smokey the Bear policy was implemented. And put everything out. That's right, put everything out. Don't take any chances. Don't take any chances. It's where your graph is, your blue graph is, oh, I was going to say it's your blue graph going downhill. Yeah, what time yeah. Period so is I've read a little bit about that. This is an area outside of my atmospheric science expertise. I just uh, run across this. So is that hill headline accurate? No. 
No. Absolutely not. How many papers ran with that headline, you think? A lot. Um, this is uh, Palmer Drought Index. All I'm trying to show here is we have, this is for the globe. We have moisture, we have drought, we have moisture, we have drought. Do you see any discernible trend of drought? Actually, the blue line is going down. The globe is experiencing less and less droughts, not more and more. Um, and they admit this in their report. Low confidence in the sign of drought trends. Low confidence in the attribution of global changes in droughts. It's in the report. Their report, not my report. It's not in the summary, though. It's not in the summary for the lawmakers. Um, okay, not a lot of time to get into this, but floods. I don't have a graphic. There is no evidence that surface water and groundwater drought frequency has changed over the last few decades. That's straight from the IPCC. Sea level rise. Very likely the mean rate of global sea level rise was 1.7 millimeters per year and 3.2 later on. In other words, it's getting bigger, it's accelerating. But it is also likely that these similarly high rates occurred way earlier <laughs> in their report. I have a paper I did, it's on the back. I actually have a couple extra copies about sea level rise at Eglin Air Force Base if you want to learn more about sea level rise. Something I had to study up on. How are we doing on time, Rob? Well, we're getting pretty. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ask me some time about glaciers. I got information on glaciers. Um, bottom line is the glacier started retreating when it started getting warmer in 1700. Um, the location of the um, visitor center at Glacier Bay National Park in 1750 would be under a glacier. And it melted well before we started producing CO2. Uh, 1974 to 1912, almost half a mile per year of melting, and now it's only melting at 178 feet per year. So actually the glacier rate, at this particular glacier in Glacier Bay National Park is melting slower, not faster. Yes, sir? Is that 1794 to 1912? Yes, 1794. Okay. Um, and I get that right from this USGS report, paper. Rob used to work for them. Or still volunteers, right? <laughs> um, and I found a second source that validates this as well. Um, these are the pictures taken of the first U.S. submarine to surface at the North Pole in March of 1959. March is still kind of winter at the North Pole. What do you see there? Water. Water. Liquid. Liquid, not ice. Water, open water at the North Pole is not something new. If we took this picture today, can you imagine the Time Magazine headline? <laughs> So, uh, went up there in 1959, water. Went up there in 1962, water. Went up there in 1987, water. Um, these pictures are taken from the National Archives. All right. Uh, and, ah, there we go, right? CO2 is plant food, bottom line. More CO2, plants grow better. You get greater output. And here's a scientific study that higher concentrations of CO2, how it works. Um, you can grow crops with less water because you have more stomata. So you have more stomata because they're getting more food, more CO2. They can grow in a more arid environment. And actually, the planet is getting greener, literally greener. This is 10 years of satellite data. And you can see in the arid regions around our deserts, more vegetation. Why? Because there's more CO2. They can survive better in the arid environments. There are areas, you know, you can see uh, um, areas at where we're burning down rainforests and things like that. But in general, the planet is getting more green, not less green in terms of plant growth. And I'll kind of conclude with this. This is a famous picture. I spent my time in the Air Force, the Wright brothers. First flight. Anyone been there? Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. This is the famous picture hanging there in the Smithsonian, Washington, D.C., 1903. That's what it looks like. Anyone been there? You guys have been out west too long. You know what it looks like today? My kids are raising their hand. That's what it looks like today. What has happened in the last 100 years? That's man-made climate change. Does that look like a catastrophe? 
This looks like Saudi Arabia turned into North Carolina. <laughs> uh, the real reason why this happened is uh, all the sand dunes, natural sand dunes, weren't big enough to keep the big storms from just washing seawater with a lot of salt over the entire island, so you couldn't grow many plants. Man, after flight, and it became popular, started building, and they built seawalls, they built artificial dunes, got bigger and bigger, they planted seagrass on it. Now not every storm breaches it, and it allowed plants to grow. And you've created an artificial man-made um, environment, and now that environment has to be protected. We created it. When you walk on the beach there, you can't step off of the boardwalk because you'll get on the man-made dunes and, and harm a uh, species that wasn't there 100 years ago. <laughs> so, I presented a lot of evidence, but kind of why is this a moral argument? Um, great, we can debate whether it's warm or more hurricanes or less hurricanes. This drives, as you saw, uh, political policies. And the main political policy is to abolish fossil fuels. God called us to use our resources to better his, his gospel going forth. The gospel has spread in the last 100 years to the four corners of the earth. How would we have done that without fossil fuels? Did we have anything to replace it with? We were burning whale oil and burning down every tree we could get our hands on. By mankind using their brain to make combustion engines and steam engines and use coal and all these things, we could figure out cleaner ways to do it, sure, but we would have not spread the gospel. We wouldn't be standing here tonight because a lot of us would be out still being hunters and gatherers and trying to defend and get enough food for our family. We have leisure time. We have time to get educated. We have time to create medicine. We have time. Um, and what happened during that time in terms of lifespan? Okay. So let me talk to you about a place that doesn't get to use fossil fuels. It's called Sub-Saharan Africa. Because of the UN and the climate policies like the Paris Climate Accords, they are not allowed to build fossil fuel power plants like we have here in the United States. They have to go from burning dung in their huts to nuclear power, solar, wind, this and that. They can't afford that. So what are they still doing? Because they can't, by law, I, I had an article last year off the top of my head, Nigeria had a few fossil fuel power power plants and they were closing them down. What's the average age, life expectancy in Sub-Saharan Africa? It's 38. Oh. Why? Because they don't have access to cheap forms of energy like we do. And therefore, they are burning dung in their huts, they are dying of respiratory diseases to the tune of seven million people per year. That's immoral. And I think we're being mostly lied to, and the policies that many are pushing are killing people. But it's, it's a weird world right now. We're the ones killing people by driving our cars. This was uh, Dr. Roster's testimony to Congress last year. So modern energy explanation has been good for the advancement of mankind, medicine, life expectancy, and those sorts of things. So as we wrap up, we don't want to unwittingly support policies that hurt the poor. The Bible calls us to take care of the widows and orphans, not have them choke on the smoke from the dung in their huts. So in conclusion, I'm not denying warming. We have warmed about one degree. CO2 is a part of it. How big of a part? Let's have a discussion. Those climate models are not very, very uh, verifying well. It looks like the sensitivity to CO2 in the actual world is way less than the models suggest. And we're not seeing these significant changes by their own testimony in their own reports, plus the data I showed you of these hydrological events. So, that hypothesis that Science Magazine put forth, do you think that's a valid hypothesis or not, based on the data I showed you tonight? I'll leave that up to you. So what should we do? In 1 Thessalonians, it tells us to examine everything carefully. Okay? Remember, there's only one truth. Hold fast to that biblical worldview, because I think when you hold fast to the biblical worldview, you are bringing honor to God. And if... A policy is not true, then it's evil, and we need to reject it. I already said this, 
Uh, and I would love to just sit here and meditate on Scripture, but let's just read this. Genesis 8.21, The Lord said in his heart, this is right after the flood, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I've done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Bottom line, we're going to have seasons and climate. And it's going to change whether we're here or not. God created all of those natural cycles, the volcanoes, the sun cycles, all of those things. And for us to think that we can control the earth's climate, I think, is a bit pompous. All right, and a lot of scripture. And in the handout, I put forth uh, some resources. I'm trying to be balanced here. If you want to go read um, the other side, um, there's the link to the IPCC. It's not entirely the other side if you read all 1,000 pages. Just the beginning is one-sided. And then the National Climate Assessment. And here's a bunch of alternate points of view that you can go look at that you'll never see or hear about generally in the news.